Hello and welcome to this Good Friday service. My name is Muntu Joshi, and I'm a pastor here at the San Ramon Valley United Methodist Church, along with my colleague, Pastor Kim Reisdorf. And we welcome you to this special service. Uh, we have other services this week as well, and you can find them on YouTube. You can find them on our Facebook page. We have a Maundy Thursday service, and we will also have an Easter service, which will be available on Easter Sunday. So if you haven't seen those, we invite you to explore those as well. Today, we're going to be meditating on the anatomy of a tear. And we are going to, while we're doing that, listen to the words traditionally ascribed to King Solomon about a time to weep, because there's a time for everything under heaven, but there's also a time to weep. And then we're going to listen to the part of the Jesus story where he is led finally to the cross. And the service will conclude with the putting out of candles and traditional readings of Christ's lament to the church. And this is, this is in the voice of Christ seeing the brokenness that is among us. And we've heard so much in the news lately, so many reasons for us to feel brokenness and to feel tears. And this is a good time for us to lament along with Christ as we listen to those pieces. Candles will be extinguished. You'll see that there's a lot of darkness, um, a lot of times for silence. And we want to invite you to take silence whenever it feels right to you. You can just pause this playback and take time to pray. For this service, we're especially encouraging you to have a piece of paper nearby Perhaps you're an artist and you have lots of, of pens and, and paints, or perhaps you're like me and you're a stick figure person. It doesn't matter, uh, but you can just have something to draw uh, next to you, a piece of paper, and be ready to pray through drawing and to find deeper meanings if that works for you. Um, the service is brief, um, but again, take as much time as you need as we process together. Here now, this reading from Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 4, which will be read by Pastor Kim Reisdorf. Scripture reading from Ecclesiastes chapter 3. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. This past season of life with the realities of the pandemic and a recognition of social wounds and disparities has really been our time to weep. Most of us avoid tears, perhaps because someone said to us as a child, stop crying, buck up, be strong. But to be human is to weep and tears in their anatomy are designed to heal. Weeping is how we begin our lives in this world. I remember the birth of our youngest daughter. The doctor at the last minute gave me permission to catch the baby. And at some point, our daughter seemed unable to progress in the birthing process. And I remember the doctor in my ear saying, you're going to have to pull. And I grabbed her head and I pulled her out as Heidi gave a large push and the hands of the nurse helped me place her on my spouse's belly. And then I heard a sound unlike any I'd ever heard before, the sound of her crying for the first time. And this is the sound of her first cries I'd like to share with you now. We are born to cry, to weep, and at the onset it clears our passages and gives us room to breathe. 
part of my work as a resident chaplain years ago was in the NICU. And I was able to hear many of these first cries. I also spent time as a resident chaplain in the Oregon burn unit. And when someone is burned, it is an extreme violence to the body and soul. I cannot tell you of the horrors of, of those hallways, the smells, the screams, the emotional burden put on the caregivers. And part of the healing process for one who has passed through fire is for the person who has been burned to mourn for themselves, for the person that they were, for the reality of the now, for the pain of the treatment, and even to mourn the scars. This was one of the most important skills for a person to survive. So many of you listening tonight have also passed through fire as well. Experiences that have left you burned. Perhaps many of you are living with those scars now. And I have learned that weeping is biologically important to our being. The process of crying signals to our body to release oxytocin and other opioids into the body. Right? These are the natural opioids, the ones our anatomy is actually built to receive in order to heal from pain. And this is why someone can be crying one moment and then just a little while later they're laughing. So when Solomon or whoever wrote Ecclesiastes says, a time to weep and a time to laugh, these are not just opposites, but a physiological connected reality, right? One flows into the other. Of course, we can also weep for joy as the, we hear in scripture, joy comes in the morning. How important was it for many of us on the eve of the inauguration as a nation to take time to mourn? And tears actually came for me when I saw the 400 luminaries reflected into the pool uh, that mirrored the more than 400,000 who had died in our country from COVID-19 to that point. And now, of course, there are many more. And we have other reasons to grieve. Many of us have lost loved ones since we met. For many of us, it's the loneliness, the weight of waiting. The weight of waiting to be in person is crushing many of us emotionally, financially, and spiritually. So I invite you to be healed by your tears. Tears have in their anatomy healing properties, almost an, an antibiotic ointment right inside them. Fans of Harry Potter might remember the tears of the phoenix that had healing powers and that's actually not too far from the truth of our own tears. God has embodied us with weeping, which is a form of healing on so many levels, from the psychological to the physical. And so we are taking time to weep. And today, after Pastor Kim reads the story of the cross, or even during the reading, you may choose to pause the service and take time to pray through drawing. And here's a suggestion. If you choose to try this exercise at home, find your piece of paper and draw a teardrop about maybe six inches tall. And in that tear, draw a picture or two of what had made you weep lately. And I encourage you to think about the losses in your own life and to claim this as a space to not only uh, immediately discover those hopes, but right now just to acknowledge the losses. And if you'd like to write in your, in your tear, uh, feel free. Or, but if you'd rather just draw uh, whatever comes to you, that is okay too. Whatever is healing for you, and maybe drawing is not your thing. Maybe you will create or imagine in a different way. Use what is best and most healing for you. You can also wait until after the service to take time and pray through drawing. And if you're with others at this point, uh, maybe a, a friend or maybe someone else that you'd like to Zoom with, take a few moments to share your tear with someone else. That can be also a part of the process. And for now, if you'd like,
please put your comments um, in a word or two of what would be on your tears. So those who are worshiping together might see what is on your heart and you might see what others have as well. I'll close this meditation by sharing with you a prayer. It was inspired by uh, Amanda Gorman uh, after hearing her poem, Be the Light. This is a prayer that came to me and I'd like to share it with you. It is a prayer for light in the pandemic. God of buried things, when hospital beds are wheeled to hallways to make room for more suffering, when workers in weary scrubs rub their necks in exhausted despair, when thousands die with last words whispered on cell phones, help us see the light. When livelihoods vanish and reserves dwindle to zero, when beloved institutions and places of faith crumble in the weight of waiting, help us see the light. And finally, if light cannot be found, when hope is buried too deep in the ground, in the soil of depression and deprivation, like seeds, let us find the light captured within waiting only for the watering of tears so that we can grow to break through to the light and discover we are never buried. We are sown. Amen. Listen now or pause to draw as Pastor Kim reads from the Gospel of John. This will be followed with Christ's lament for the church and our final hymn. Our reading comes from John chapter 18 and 19, when Jesus is brought before Pilate. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters, and it was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated what kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask me this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. And they kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, 
I am bringing him to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to him, here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat at the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was a day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, here is your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves. For my clothing, they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Joseph saw his mother and the disciple who he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Oh, my people, 
O my church, what have I done to you? Or in what have I offended you? I led you forth from the land of Egypt and delivered you by the waters of baptism. But you have prepared a cross for your Savior. I led you through the desert 40 years and fed you with manna. I brought you through times of persecution and of renewal and gave you my body, the bread of heaven. But you have prepared a cross for your Savior. I made you branches of my vineyard and gave you the water of salvation. But when I was thirsty, you gave me vinegar and gall and pierced with a spear the side of your Savior. I went before you in a pillar of cloud, but you have led me to the judgment hall of Pilate. I brought you to the land of freedom and prosperity but you have scourged, mocked, and beaten me. I gave you a royal scepter and bestowed the keys to the kingdom, but you have given me a crown of thorns. I raised you on high with great power, but you have hanged me on the cross. My peace I gave, which the world cannot give, and washed your feet as a servant. But you draw the sword to strike in my name and seek high places in my kingdom. I accepted the cup of suffering and death for your sakes, but you scatter and deny and abandon me. I sent the spirit of truth to lead you, but you close your hearts to guidance. I called you to go and bring forth fruit, but you cast lots for my clothing. I prayed that you all may be one, but you continue to quarrel and divide. Go. I grafted you into the tree of my chosen people, Israel, but you turned on them and with persecution and mass murder. I made you joint heirs with them of my covenants, but you made them scapegoats for your own guilt. I came to you as the least of your brothers and sisters. I was hungry, but you gave me no food. Thirsty, but you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, but you did not welcome me. Naked, but you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, but you did not visit me.
Thank you.